So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce Einar Sawyer, who has come to us from uh, UCSF. Uh, she is the director of the UCSF Skeletal Health Program and uh, uh, Health Innovation and Technology in Orthopedics. She really has a, a unique background because she has a background in uh, physical therapy and then um, was a physical therapist, I believe, and then uh, became an MD later um, and has brought together her love of informatics and technology with this appreciation of physical therapy, very hands-on uh, sort of science, uh, and as, as a surgeon as well and has brought those skills together. And today she'll be talking about some examples where uh, they're using technology, in particular uh, VR, uh, to help manage uh, musculoskeletal and, and joint and orthopedic problems. So thank you for being with us today, Anna. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I feel funny speaking here because I feel like I've come to the mountain to learn, actually. So uh, it'll be an information exchange, I hope, and I hope there's something worthwhile for everybody in this. It's also a little bit like a 12-step meeting because I'm going to confess that we in the orthopedic world are part of the problem. And I'll talk to you about that because it's also a cry for help. We hopefully, uh, you'll see that we are really, really open and hoping that you'll engage with us. This is what I mean by coming to the mountain. Most of the work that I'm aware of in the evidence-based side of this is happening at this institution with Brennan and also at Stanford Walter. So I'm really uh, feel humbled to be here. Um, I want to talk briefly and lay some groundwork around the opioid, pro the opioid crisis and the role of orthopedic surgery in it. This has been probably stated several times already, but it's so profound to me. 40 people die every day from overdoses of prescription narcotics, and when I look at that list, I've ordered many of them, and so have my colleagues, and, and we still are. Uh, and we also know that most of these overdoses um, are, are coming because of prescription meds or at least started there. And this is really telling to me because we actually see car crashes, we see gunshot victims, and to think now that more deaths are happening because of opioids, which we're using in our treatment, than the injuries that are bringing them to us is also alarming. And this slide really you've probably seen before as well, but for me the key thing that stands out is that 75% of these people who are dying from um, opioid abuse started through a prescription drug process. So we feel very responsible, and we also feel like we want to get empowered and proactive behind it. Our own Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is very involved in this, and they should be because orthopedic surgeons are number four on the list of people who are prescribing the most. We're behind dentists, but so we have a big responsibility in this. And then the Pain Society and Anesthesiology Society also are partnering in looking at new strategies. And the, most of the recommendations are fairly repetitive. They seem obvious, but they're not being implemented in any sort of organized way. Of course, multimodality analgesia, using the non-pharmacologics. And there's a lot of evidence behind those. We think of them as just a throwaway line when we're talking to our patients, but there's a lot of evidence that these things can be very effective. So there are also guidelines around the management of post-operative pain, and again, they're spelled out here. They include the milder forms of analgesia, the non-pharmacologics, which again is another throwaway line, because what is that? I learned a lot in, as a PT in biofeedback and pain management, et cetera, but most of us in the traditional medical world aren't trained in that way. So what is meditation? What are relaxation therapies? And then, of course, regional anesthesia also has its place. So AOS is putting out guidelines for us. They're really trying to help us, and they've put out some specific toolkits for us. One of the things on this slide that I think is interesting is a safe return of these medications. We actually don't empower our patients to responsibly get rid of the meds that they don't use. We don't even have processes at our hospital to take them back. So this is probably for any entrepreneur out there, this is a problem that needs to be solved and probably could be done in a, in a creative way. There are also some guidelines around fractures, and a lot of them start out with immobilization, ice elevation, acetaminophen and ibuprofen. So don't forget ice is nice. And we talk about all the other things and we forget the simple things. But as a PT, we learned that early on. I still use it in my practice a lot. 
And then moving down the scale, the larger the bone, the more proximal it is, the more likely there's going to be a need or at least a tendency to use a narcotic. And then these are interesting because these are procedures. So these are post-procedural recommendations. And I find it interesting that if you're thinking about even a simple lack, they're talking about 10 pills of hydrocodone. So some of them don't seem well aligned yet, but it's a starting point to try to get some systems in place. I also want to highlight the fact that we have excess opioids. And if you think about it, there's so many prescribed that every American could have their own bottle of pills. That's how many prescriptions we're writing. And we actually started tracking this in orthopedics because we're trying to figure out, well, how many of those are unused? We talk about opioid abuse, so we assume there are no unused pills, but that's actually not the case. So these are just looking across different orthopedic procedures, and these are mean unused pills in this study. And that's actually quite profound. Many of them have 30 unused pills sitting in the house. And one of the problems is that we typically write for 30 or 40. And so those are standard things we've learned along the way in our training, our practice patterns, et cetera. But the truth is they usually end up in the wrong hands. And over half of the way that people get the opioids that are being abused are from a friend or a relative. So again, we feel like part of the problem there. So we're looking hard at how can we write order sets where we give a much more reasonable amount? How can we study what is the mean amount for each use case? The other thing we can do is more counseling because expectations for pain relief in our country are very different than other cultures. And if you look at the differences between opioid abuse in the US and elsewhere, you'll see that as well. We tend to really undersell the post-op course. I told you it was a 12-step meeting. Um, we do. We honestly do. And I've had enough surgeries now to say that's really not fair because when you have all this pain post-op, you think you're off the rails. You think something's really wrong with you. So it's really important to spend time up front doing the counseling, setting the expectations of what is the pain going to likely be. Some people say it's response priming. I think it's actually empowering. You're telling them what it's going to be, what strategies can they use. And you can see in this study that it actually decreased the number of pills that were used, even day zero in this hand surgery case. And this is another thing. Wow, <laughs> Eric looks very cold there. Um, on my screen, he's blue. Oh, thank you. Well, anyway, the point of this is that we have a new culture of patients as well, and people are expecting more and, and more uh, have more availability, availability to information, but how they use it, how they synthesize it, we still can be very helpful in that. But keep in mind that this, I think, is the era of the empowered patient. It may not be all across board. It's not evenly distributed, but I think it's important because we can leverage this. An engaged and activated patient, we have enough studies to show they get better outcomes. So we should really be involving our patients in conversation much more uh, upfront than we have been. And then can we do any predictions on this? We really want to know who is going to be the person who abuses the medication? They don't all. Who's at the highest risk? And just this slide, don't even need to read all this. It's just to say there are many studies in many parts of orthopedics where we're looking at this. And actually, there's now an opioid risk tool for narcotic abuse. There's more than one. I'm sure someone else presented others. But this one's really helpful to us because we can see a real use of this in our practices. The low-risk categories actually many fewer display aberrant behaviors around medication usage. And in the high-risk categories, um, they did. So it's important for us in terms of predicting, tailoring, and individualizing our pain management strategies. This was interesting, too, because there are some specific risks. If they had a preoperative opioid use pattern, they were 10 times more likely to be filling those narcotic prescriptions five months out from the surgery which is really, in most of our surgeries, even spine fusions, it's really aberrant behavior. The more invasive the surgery, the more use and the more refilling of the prescription. And ironically, the younger patients actually had more refills later. So we need to get more quantitative about how we understand a pe person's pain profile. And so this is just one tool. I think it's interesting, pain pressure pressure thresholds, and it actually correlates well with um, opioid consumption downstream, especially the lowest category, those who tolerate the least amount of pressure and, toler and feel it early on and state that are most likely to use opioids in an aberrant way. 
So I want to talk a little bit about VR in managing MSK or musculoskeletal uh, conditions. And again, I said I came to the mountain. There was a study done with joint patients inpatient here um, at Cedar sinai and they did see an effect, and this I think was a one-time dose. It was a one-time use of VR, and they compared it to uh, 2D high-def nature video dosing, and they did see a difference between the two groups in terms of pain relief, and I think that's very, very important. I think what's interesting is the way I read it, that they didn't really see uh, so what they did see also was that it's a safe and practical way um, to give some adjunctive pain management, and I think that's important. So these are important studies, one by one by one. Obviously, people can criticize all of our study designs because it's so new. We're trying this in any way we can. What I was getting to, though, about the whole picture is we need also to take into account not just the subjective, but the objective or the measurable quantitative aspects of whether a person has pain or not. So working out a constellation of physiologic measures, some say heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, body movement with an accelerometer, or even we could start adding voice analytics, because most people in pain make some sort of a sound. So putting together a suite of more objective measures and leveraging um, smart analytics to find out if we can pair up qualitative and quantitative. And so, in fact, um, this study that, was, that I referenced, they didn't see much difference in the physiologics, but I think it might have been small or we didn't, there wasn't a big enough suite of them. But in the next study that they're doing, I was happy to see this, they're actually going to leverage several things in here, VR, smartwatch, and TENS. So putting together more and more a tapestry of solutions rather than thinking of VR as one, one uh, fix agent, when we know that's not really how any of our systems work. So I think this is exciting. I think the partnerships in this are very exciting. And I, and I also think this is a tremendous opportunity. Work comp injuries account for a significant amount of money. And most of the reason people go on long-term disability, believe it or not, isn't really functional. It's actually pain related. So this is important. Pediatric orthopedics is a completely wide open opportunity. We have intense but short uh, painful procedures that these kids have to undergo. Sometimes they undergo many, many times. They usually end up very scarred and have a traumatic experience with the healthcare system the rest of their lives. So there are trials going on and have been done in cast application removal, pin extraction, venipuncture, wound care. You heard about the burn debridement, et cetera. And I think it's important to think of all the goals around it. Minimize fear and pain, avoid the lasting medical trauma, and avoid the risks of the known harmful effects on the very young neuroplastic window that we're talking about with kids who are developing. And it's not just uh, general anesthesia, but systemic medications as well. Also, there's an interesting study about phantom limb pain. I only bring this up. I think you're going to hear more about mirroring therapy tomorrow. So I'm only bringing this up to say that mirroring therapy is very powerful. I remember using it well in, as, with stroke patients. But it also is very easy to break out of. And with the VR mirroring experiences, I think it's a more contained experience. And they're definitely seeing some benefits um, in phantom limb pain. And sort of it's tricking the brain into thinking the limb is still there. So it's not getting confusing signals and making up its own signals and saying it's pain when it's not sensing anything. So looking at our own work at UCSF, and I will say it's, it's uh, very nascent compared to what's been going on here, but that's why we all come together and thank you for convening this. We're looking at it in some very general ways first. We're exploring mixed measurements of what we're referring to as PGD, PGHD, I say patient-generated data, but this came out of, I think, the ONC patient-generated health data. I think we could throw the health out, because when you say patient, I think you've covered that. So I'm going to say PGD, but mixed measurements. Um, so we're getting qualitative and quantitative, looking at predictive measures and individualizing care plans and exploring inclusion and exclusion criteria. I think that's really important. There are some people who this either they won't be a responder, we need to understand those people, or they actually can't tolerate it. So that's a very important piece of this. And then we're looking at alternative interactive capabilities, the active interactive um, exposure seem to have more benefit than the passive. But if you're on the operating room table, you really don't want people flailing their arms. So how are they active? So there's a new company, Fove, not so new, but they've just put out another version where they're using eye movements to actually do the interactive. So that means you could also survey patients in there. 
and ask them to ask interact questions. You could create information coming back to you. Once you figure out more creative ways to get interactivity, and for us, we really want to do that. A lot of our patients also have limited abilities. So we're very, very interested at UCSF in pediatrics, of course, and you know this is our big interactive media wall in every room now, but we're also then putting this in mixed media and working with some VR capabilities with children. One of them is with the sickle cell patients who come in in sickle cell crisis, extremely painful. And believe it or not, a lot of the hemonc patients actually have um, severe joint disability and bone pain, so we do get involved in these cases. And what I'm really interested in now is um, Duke is going to leverage some of the early work and do an RCT and a bigger scale on this in the sickle cell and also cancer patients. So our big vision, because as I said, we try to think, how is this going to fit into the entire fabric or tapestry of pain management and improving patient function? So I look at a continuum a continuum of care or the patient journey and pick spine patients, for instance, starting from evaluation through prehab, through pre-op, operative recovery room, acute stay, and then post-discharge, and then long-term optimization of function. And I see at every one of those sections a window of opportunity for VR to play a role in the context of the entire treatment plan. So very quickly, we'll talk a little bit about, I think the VR education opportunities for patients are extraordinary. There's a way that they can understand when they see things in 3D that oftentimes they can't when I'm drawing on the paper on my treatment table uh, or even in the iPad PowerPoints that I usually use in my office. So I think there's some great opportunities to truly get information across and we could even tailor those and individualize those to patients. Setting expectations, many of these things can be done in the VR medium and then teaching to manage symptoms and empowering them. Exercise programs, we're working very hard in the pre-op optimization of our patients. And so, obviously, the prehab exercise programs will reflect work that's been done in the rehab exercise programs already with VR, and we have opportunities there. And remember, this isn't just a push. This is a push and a pull. We should be getting information back from these devices at the same time and understanding how patients are responding to them, where they're engaging most in the, in the experience, et cetera. And then also VR is being used in some test cases around fall prevention. And it's kind of a mixed bag. You want to make sure they're in a protective gizmo while they're doing it. And you'll see a picture of that later. So we are looking at a perioperative pain intervention for hand surgery with applied VR, which is a team that Brent has worked with before. And we're looking at using it in the preoperative period, the intraoperative, and the postoperative. And we're also looking at how are we going to create interactivity without arms flailing, partly because one of the PIs is an anesthesiologist, and that was main resistances to the study, so we promised we'd work around that. Um, and then also we are comparing with and without blocks and, and to standards of care. Um, the post-operative period immediately in the recovery room, there's nice work that was done at Stanford in the pediatric area about this, and then also on the inpatient room, I gave you an example of that already. But also, it's not just pain management, continue the education and the empowerment process, and we have the ability to in that platform. And then for post-discharge, in orthopedics, we are uh, crash test dummies for bundled payment, shall we say? And so we're really responsible. Not only do we care already with our internal compasses, but now reimbursement is actually going to be based on our 90-day function and the patient's outcomes. So we are working very hard on these care continuum platforms that extend well outside of our facilities. And so looking at how we can assist with pain management in that, obviously, for me as the skeletal health service doc, I want to prevent falls. And I know what the opioids can do to patients. They cause so many problems downstream that I, I look at this from a PT and a doctor standpoint and say, what can we do to substitute, to augment, to replace those medications? And then we also should be looking at, can we use VR in a long-term way? And I heard a comment earlier that I really agree with about the idea of, look at chronic pain. It's probably not as glamorous as acute. It might take longer to see differences. We don't know dosing, frequency, exposures, et cetera. But it's a really important opportunity. Because remember that statement that patients who come in already using opioids will have a much more difficult course post-op. So can we get them off of the medications before, God forbid, they need us again? 
Um, and cognitive training is really important, especially in our geriatric patients. This is something we could do cognitive testing and training and physical testing and training in the VR medium. And then intersect this with the rest of the care continuum platform. This is an example of one that we're using. But imagine if you could do prediction and tailor and make an individualized care plan you could actually enter that into Health Loop where they get these preemptive messages every day and you could actually create a pain management care plan with them where you're messaging them and you're really being supportive of how many pills are you using, what other options have you tried, let's talk about uh, other types of interventions and remind them on the spot when they need the information but intersect with other platforms we're using. This is also to say that we can do exercise. I'm not going to go into this because you're going to have some really nice talks on this, I know, coming up. And I also, though, think about it in terms of incentivizing it, but also guiding the appropriateness and the quality of the activity they're doing, and also measuring the activity. A decrease in activity can be because of increased pain, and increased pain can be because of a developing wound sepsis, I mean, wound infection, or a DVT. So all of these things are interconnected. And so I, I also want to just highlight one more time the idea of quantitative and qualitative data when you're building studies or when you're building interventions. Think about how we can have the best metrics possible because we have to show effectiveness, effectiveness in care and effectiveness, effectiveness in cost as we're bringing these interventions in. And this is just an example to show you that we're intersecting many different systems as we should in one body, not just technology platforms. And I, I give this credit, of course, to Adam Gazelli and his lab. And he's looking at the linkages between cognitive activities, which he started with in his lab. He got people up on their feet and started adding activity. And the physical and the cognitive are sort of feeding each other. There's a synergistic response. And what I'd really like to see is can we then add in some metrics about pain? Excuse me. <laughs> and he built a beautiful model called the glass brain. And we could look at neural transmission. Um, <coughs> sorry. But can we also, at some point, use the glass brain to track pain? Um, <clears throat> so, so, thank you. Training is a, a very important piece. Not just the patient, but the provider. <clears throat> I think I need to do some imaging. I'm not going to spend time on this. You've got some nice talks coming up. But think about the anxiety of the surgeon and the trainee and how you can minimize that by having them be more prepared. And there are nice simulated models for that. Or supporting them in the ER, in the OR when they need more information. We're using this in a combination of combining 3D imaging in different media. So from the CT 3D reconstruction, we're adding 3D AR and VR, and we're integrating that with our 3D printed models, which we we're pr producing on site now. And all of this greatly enhances surgical planning. So in our strategies for pain, number one, we're measuring ourselves. We have residents measurement program looking at how many they're prescribing. This is state of California looking at how many we're all prescribing. But we also want to provide optimized and tailored management programs, set realistic expectations, and use our predictive tools. And then we want to do this in a multimodality way and really leverage non-pharmacologic tools that we haven't been looking at, that are really have been around for ages and there is evidence behind them. Now a new kid on the block VR, we need to build evidence for that. And I think we can really make this a comprehensive um, suite and I also think we can do this best by partnering. So I throw out that invitation. Thank you.